Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as the February Room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. Justin Carnop here, and uh, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we really need the support of our listeners. And uh, if you could please take a minute to subscribe, share, and leave a review for us on whatever podcast platform you use, we'd really appreciate that. Um, at 17 million acres, uh, Alaska's Tongass is America's largest national forest and is affectionately referred to as the Salmon Forest. Uh, within this ecosystem, 17,000 miles of undammed rivers and streams um, bisect this forest and that, uh, that still teem with, with salmon and trout. Uh, all these fish feed this unique e ecosystem with nutrients from the Pacific um, and the Tongass is part of the world's last remaining intact temperate rainforest. It also hosts the highest density of brown bears in North America. Uh, yet most of this habitat is not congressionally protected and remains open to development activities. Our guest today is on the front lines in the battle to protect and conserve the Tongass. Mark Hieronymus, welcome to the February Room, and I hope I said your last, last name right. You did. You're one of the few, and thanks for having me. You bet. Well, I, I think it's still in my mind from um, from years ago when uh, when you helped us out on a Trout Unlimited show that we did up there. Unfortunately, I didn't get to attend on that one. That was one of my my uh, big regrets in life because it looked like an amazing experience. Yeah, that was a fun one. That was definitely uh, that was actually before I was when I was still volunteering with Trout Unlimited when I was just uh, guiding and. Uh, that was definitely uh that was a fun excursion. We we had, you know, the the backstory and you you may remember some of this or you may have tried to black it out because we had uh seventeen inches of rain in the three days prior uh to you guys arriving. And so oh, that's it was, right. It, it was a mad scramble to 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 find water that did not look like a chocolate shake that actually had fish in it. And it was oh man. But you know. The, through the wonder of television, we pulled it off, right? Right, right. And yeah, you can rest assured that if you're planning a television shoot, there's going to be 17 inches of rain the day before you get there. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually the case. Well, with a, with a last name like Hieronymus, um, I know you have uh, some great fishing stories to share with us. Yeah, you know, I got a, I got a pile of memories and not much uh, for, you know picking out something that I've done. I, I actually, you know what? I got a great one, man. This, so a lot of my, a lot of my stories come from, you know, a lot of my experiences come, uh, during my guide season, uh, in the summertime, I guide for Bear Creek Outfitters. Um, uh, we're one of the largest guided fishing operations in Alaska, um, in non-pandemic years, let me add. Um, right. and, and years ago, yeah, so a lot of my, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time fishing myself, but I, I observe fishing uh, <laughs> and, and, help, and, and help fishing. I'm, a, I'm a, a facilitator there. You're an observer. You're an observer of fly fishing. That's that's right. That's what yeah, every, so, every uh, guide's uh, card should say. Sorry to interrupt. Exactly, you. right? Professional observer. So, yeah. um, so I've had conservatively, I've taken – 6,000 plus people fishing in my guiding career. And, uh, you know, I'm a high volume guide and a lot of, as a consequence, I, there's, there's some folks that, you know, kind of rise above that their memory, you know, be it for good or bad reasons, their memory, you know, their, their, their experience sticks with me. And so I can relate it. And one that I remember very vividly 
uh, which is given my advanced age is pretty good. Uh, 2015, I had this kid. Um, I want to say his name was Alex. I won't say his, I can't remember his last name, but I'm pretty sure it started with a C. But Alex was from Montana, right? Part of the backstory here is a lot of a lot of our bookings used to, uh, you know, come through the cruise industry. We we offered our services to to passengers just stopping in town for a day. Hey, do you want to if if you wanted to come to Alaska, but your wife made you come on a cruise, or you know, if your husband doesn't fly fish or whatever, come out and fish with us, right? And so. Um, when, when people book cruises, that's given an option. That's an option to go fly fishing. Right. And so what I didn't know about this kid at the time was that his dad gave him this trip as a Christmas present six months prior to his trip. And the kid apparently just lost his mind. Like he was an avid fisherman. This is a nine-year-old we're talking about, right? He's a, he's a fairly <laughs> avid fly fisherman in Mon Montana, but he started researching Alaska and tying flies and doing all this stuff. And so when he showed up at the shop, it was just this tiny ball of of anticipation, excitement, uh, questions, you know, curiosity, and and I I don't have children. I'm I'm I you know my the common thing I people say when you, well do you like kids and I say well yeah but I can't eat a whole one. I'm not really <laughs> a parental. I'm not necessarily a parental type. <laughs> and and uh, but I'm much more than tolerant because I'm really enthusiastic about these kids fishing, right? But this kid was just bouncing off the walls, man. He was so excited, and I was thinking, man, this is just going to be a work day for me, man. I'm going to have to keep this kid contained. The place that I had already selected to go and where I was kind of constrained to because we had other groups out was, you know, one of the barrier areas that we go to. And I was thinking, man, how am I going to, you know? I might lose this kid in the grass. He's like three foot nine, right? <laughs> so I was trying to, th you know, how am I going to make this kid? How am I going to get this kid the best experience possible? Turns out I didn't have any. I didn't have to do anything. I mean, the kid was just—he was awesome from start to finish, and so much that I really I focused quite a bit with him that day. And and you know, he showed me all the flies that he tied, and 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 some of them, you know, they might have worked under different conditions. We got really specific you know, very specific patterns that we use in our fisheries here, very specific um, patterns and techniques, I'd say, to, to really ensure success in a short window, right? right. And so we tried fishing some of his flies, and I, and, and I told him, I said, you know, Alex, man, I, I really, really, really want to see you hooked up to a fish. And by the way, this is one of those things where it was, you know, a three-foot-nine kid. You just don't give him an adult fly rod. So thanks to, you know, huge shout-out to, to Tim and, uh, Tim Ray Jeff and company down at Echo for providing the gecko. I mean, they were the first to make a kid's rod and the industry has kind of kept along with that too. But man, that's been a, a lifesaver for tiny little kid hands, that little seven and a half foot rod that they can cast. Uh, almost impossible to break. I've tried to break them. I've had kids just reef on it and they can't break it. But at any rate, I digress. So Alex had his little gecko and and he wanted to fish his flies. And I said, all right, man, here, it's time. You need to put on one of these. We tied one on. And without his second or third cast, he tied into a chrome humpy. And the world, for him, the world disappeared. If it was outside of the rod, the line, and the fish, it was literally Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, the womp womp. womp, womp. <laughs> and, and I took a picture in that moment. And then I asked his dad if I could share it on, on, on social media. And he said, yeah. Um, and I think it's somewhere on my on my Instagram feed. And I look at that picture every now and then because that's the reminder of why I started doing all this, why I care, why, why, you know, and I hate to bring this back to me just because it's this, you know, this kid, I, I really enjoyed facilitating this kid, absolutely losing his mind. And I would actually like to look him up at some point in Montana, if I could find him to find out how, you know, we all say that fly fishing saves lives, but man, sometimes it can just, you know, when you get that hook that early, sometimes it can kind of derail it too. But I would like <laughs> to catch up with the kid just to see where he's at right now. But I look at that picture and, and see, 100% unadulterated stoke with no, not a care in the world. 
other than that connection to that fish. And that's, you know, to me, that, that moment, it's, it's powerful and priceless, man. I can't believe that I got paid for that day. You know what I mean? Right, man. That's so awesome. And you know, that kid was, he, when he came home, could you imagine being nine years old and having that under your belt? Yeah. I went to Alaska and, and whacked some salmon on a fly rod. Yeah. You know, and I took a picture of him holding the fish and, and I tried to, you know, I really, you know, with, with as many folks as I've taken out and the wide range of, of both abilities and awareness about the sport, I try to, I try to instill some, some fish handling, you know, some fish respect and fish handling values. And, and so he was holding this pink salmon, which is, you know, for once again, a three foot nine kid with tiny hands, man, this is like some, one of us holding a, you know, a 40 pound king, right? <laughs> the perfect hand model. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I was like, I'm going to take you on all my trips. <laughs> you make right. it look like you make these fish look gigantic. But, uh, at one point he, he, I had him, I had him dip the fish down in the water and I said, okay, get ready. Hold your breath. When you pull the fish out, hold your breath. And then when you can't breathe, the fish can't breathe either. So put him back. And so he picked the fish up and the fish did one of those, you know, those, uh, head swing flops, you, you know, co-hosts sure. do it a lot. Humpies do it a lot too. And it did a head swing flop, like right into his face. And so he did what pretty much anybody would do and just kind of grabbed it in a big hug and I also have that picture and, and I don't think that one will ever see the light of day. Um, not in least part because I don't need anybody on the net telling me, you know, how to share sure. fish, but that picture is also, you know, I'm pretty sure I sent that one to his dad's email. I got I guess I got to go back and check now, but that one is equally priceless. I was just like, man, that, that kid is just in love with that fish. It's such a cool moment and having, you know, I know his dad was actually right behind me taking pictures too. So having those memories, you know, at that early age, I mean, look out world, that kid's going to have fun. Yeah, man, those days make, uh, make all the other, you know, the, the, the tough days, maybe with the, uh, the, the type a, uh, uh, venture capitalist, uh, worth it. Right. Yeah, definitely. They definitely do. You know, I mean, those guys, that kind of client too, you want to work, you know, you want to work hard and you want to, you want to, there's always that feeling of contempt that you're being, you know, that you're being relegated to the service industry. And, and I try to find ways to, you know, it doesn't really affect me. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not something that, that, you know, I lie awake at night thinking about, but I always find an effective way to, to push back and make sure that they understand that, that they hired me for a reason, that there's information that they're lacking. And, and I'm their gateway to all that they seem to want. And so, you know, be nice to me. Be nice to your guides. If you're listening, everybody. Damn straight. Be nice to your guide. Tip That's the guide. takeaway. And we're done. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> all right. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk, everybody. I'm out of here. Oh, that's awesome. Do, do you still guide uh, a, a pretty full schedule, Mark? Or are you, are you, uh, have you trimmed that back um, in lieu of everything that you're doing with Trout Unlimited? Um, you know, I was straddling the line there for a while. Um, I was, I was, uh, signing off at TU and in, in until 2020, you know, I'm going to be blunt until 2020. I was doing that. Um, signing off with TU. Um, I used to, I used to guide from May until late September. And then I trimmed that back to June 15th to, uh, September 1st and 2020 came around and I, I made the decision to not to not guide. And then my outfitter made the decision to not offer trips. He didn't think it was, you know, we do all fly out trips and you're in a tiny little airplane, you know, in a, in a, you know, how many, how many square feet of, of space do you have in a, in a 206 or in a beaver, right? It's about 18, <laughs> maybe 19, you know, and I, we all, at the time when we were all pre-vaccinated, we decided, you know, let's, let's just not do this. Let's, let's wait and see. We had no idea what was going on. So fast forward to 2020, we picked it up. Booking guests were strongly recommended to be vaccinated. We we're going to have uh, masks and planes and things like that. And I ended up doing, I don't know, I think I took 20, 20 trips this year. So I probably took between I haven't even looked, but like 60 to 80 guests, a normal, a normal year for me, 2011 to 2019 was anywhere from 400 to 475 taking, you know, 
clients taken out. So, wow. so yeah, I've, you know, in part, in part because of, of the pandemic, I've slowed down my work, but then also in, in 2019, I pivoted, I used to do uh, outreach for Trout Unlimited. I used to be the sport fish outreach coordinator. And as such, I would talk to um, folks. I'd go to sports shows uh, across the West Coast. I do in in Alaska outreach, mostly with with uh, sport fishing businesses, you know, uh, lodges, fellow guides, things like that. And I started pivoting away from that in in uh, May of 2018, and and you know, we had additional capacity. Uh, within the organization to sort of backfill on that because I was sort of pushing out another end. I was pushing out. We've been playing defense for a long time, and I was on. I was doing some biological work that would take us on, you know, not necessarily offense, but we do good, you know, good by the fish. Instead of defending and holding the line on conservation, we were we were advancing something, right? And well, as of I guess July of this year, I finally made the full pivot uh, away from public advocacy, public outreach, and into uh, biological work. And so my new, my new title is uh, community science coordinator, and my new work is uh, identifying and mapping. Uh, a lot of my new work is identifying and mapping uh, fish habitat, previously undocumented fish habitat, as well as what I like to call underdocumented habitat, which is not the, the true assemblage, you know, the true fish community, the true species richness isn't reflected in the legal documents that the state has so well and, and what's the best way to identify that habitat with a fly rod in hand well the fly rod in hand you know <laughs> hook, hook and line is definitely a tool and that's a recognized tool by fish and game and sometimes that's you know one of the most expedient ways to do it but um you know con- there is kind of an illusion that that, that that well mark gets paid to run around and fish and that's not really right. the case there um a lot of it you know i've got a dry suit uh, and I float down some freezing cold rivers, you know, our steelhead streams are, 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 some of them are barely over 33 degrees in the springtime. And it's really, really, really rare to go steelhead fishing in anything more than about 40 degrees or water, because after that they're really spawning there, you know, you don't want to be out there fishing for them. But so a lot of my work, uh, in the springtime is, is looking, you know, trying to figure out where, uh, you know, through through modeling and through through traditional ecological knowledge, local knowledge, uh, anecdotal observation, where steelhead live that they haven't been um, that they haven't been officially documented in uh, in the state of Alaska's and Adams Waters catalog. And so far, since 2018, we've added 10 steelhead rivers to the Tongass. Wow, that's so amazing! Um, so most of your or all of your work is within the Tongass. Um, at the moment, I'm, you know, we had a pilot program uh, this this summer. Um, we coordinated with the Kenai uh, Peninsula chapter of Trout Unlimited and and helped them prepare for their own uh, habitat investigations, habitat surveys, and and so we're kind of working out the bugs on that. My hope is that I can, you know, with the the, the fish habitat mapping is one part. The community science is the other part. And hopefully I can I can get, um, you know, I've got about 10 or 12 volunteers I can call on right now. And then the idea is to grow that out into this, into um, a group of folks that's, that, you know, conservation-minded anglers that, that would like to see and would like to participate in this, in this, uh, in this work. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that program right now. Well, man, put me on the list. I'm, I'm sure you, I'm <laughs> you, sure you don't have much I, trouble. I'm sure you don't have much trouble finding join. volunteers, volunteers for that. Could you uh, explain to me exactly where the Tongass is? Sure. Um, the easiest way to do that is to. This is for everybody listening at home. This is the uh, interactive portion of today's of today's uh, podcast. <laughs> Excellent. Stick your right hand out. Out in front of you, arm's length away, stick your thumb out. Now stick your index finger out as well, so you're making a modified Spock, right? Then you're going to turn your hand sideways, facing to the left, so your thumb is down. Okay? Okay. That's a map of Alaska. Your thumb is where the Tongass National Forest is. 
the Tongass National. Okay, Easy now we're done. With the inter- we're done with the interactive portion. It's basically Baja, Alaska. Um, it's the Tongass National Forest is about 450 miles long, and it stretches from south of Ketchikan at the uh, at the U.S. Canada border or the Alaska Canada border, and then it's a pretty small slice of land. It's mostly uh, mostly islands there from the mainland side, you go back about 30 to 40 miles and that's the Canadian border and it's the coast range right there. And that kind of makes its jagged way up towards Skagway and then curves over towards Glacier National Park. And then the Tongass ends up around Yakutat, which is about once again, 450 miles. Like if you were, if, if the North side of the Tongass was in Portland, Oregon, the South side would be in Fran- uh, San Francisco. So that's about how big it is. It's about 125 miles when you uh, wide when you take in all the islands. Um, it's a maritime temperate climate, which is pretty cool because I grew up in Washington State, specifically in Seattle. And so for anybody that's ever fished the Olympic Peninsula, it's like the OP, but with smaller rivers. We don't have, we don't, you know, we've got a few large transboundary rivers, but most of our waters are, uh, are much smaller, uh, much smaller than that. So yeah, Southeast Alaska, man, it's just, a, it's this verdant emerald green area. I mean, that's probably the one comment that I hear most from, from visitors, from, you know, visiting anglers, people that come up, they say, man, you know, I thought I knew what green was, but you guys got, you pretty much got green cornered. This is what green looks like up here. And that's all fed, um, you know, by the, by the massive runs of, of salmon and steelhead, uh, correct? I mean, that's the reason part of the reason why the forest is the way that it is, right? From all the nutrients that the fish bring in uh, from the Pacific? It is, it definitely is. You know, um, we get, we've been, we've been, you know, they're obviously salmon are very cyclical in their populations. And we've been, we've been on some long depressions, especially for king salmon. Um, we had, we had a, a, a humpy, a pink salmon, just absolute explosion. No, literally no hatchery influence down here. That matter of fact, in 2013 on our, our large run year, we had, um, there were roughly 120 million salmon that came back. The harvest was around 99, maybe 101 million in Southeast Alaska. And of that, there were maybe a million and a half that were hatchery production. So Imagine, imagine a hundred million, and that's just pink salmon. Imagine a hundred million salmon coming back to coastal Oregon and Northern California. And yeah, Jeez. you can kind of get an idea what the Tongass is like, except a lot of our, you know, a lot of our streams are fairly small. Many of our streams, the anadromous portion due to the topography, you know, we're really, it's, it's fairly steep up here. We're crunched up into the, we're basically the footlands of the coastal range. And so everything comes out of the water fairly abruptly. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of flat valleys, you know, large flat valleys for uh, for large salmon streams, right? But we've got a ton, you know, 18 or 8,000 uh, anadromous streams currently that we know about, and we, we've we only documented about 50% of those. But at any rate, the anadromous streams are... Jeez. The, the average the average length of, a, of an anadromous reach in southeast Alaska, and this is just an average, the average length is one and a half kilometers. So they're very, very, very small streams. Wow. Uh, and so they're, they're, we, we're, we're not operating on the typical watershed um, look. You know, if, if people think of a watershed, they normally think of a single point flowing out in the ocean. And then everything that's behind that, all the tributaries, they're contributing to that main flow, right? Well, our watershed looks a little different. If you mag- imagine the salt water that's in between the islands and these channels as the main flow, and then all these other little rivers that are actually standalone watersheds in and of themselves flowing into that as tributaries, that'll give you a better idea. How to, I mean, that's that's how I look at it. And that's, it, it's, it, it seems, it helps quite a bit when I'm thinking about fish habitat. But back to the original thing. Yeah, man. I mean, it's like the, nature's fertilizer. I, how, the, how, how many happy trees do we have that there's every year millions of fish swim out of the ocean to throw themselves at the feet of these trees <laughs> and the trees are right. the trees are scooping that stuff up and it's really actually cool since since the early 2000s i think the oh i'm trying to remember there's a paper gendy et al um that did uh nutrient transport away from riparian corridors and what they found was that that brown bears 
uh, brown bears, wolves, um, martens, otters, uh, you know, all the little, the large and small mammals are, are nutrient transport. You know, they'll go catch a fish and then they'll take it off to their hidey hole and they're finding, you know, the, the, the nitrogen isotopes, the saltwater isotopes, um, in, in the forest up to a kilometer away from the rivers. Right. So it's this, this nutrients are just being dragged off. I mean, the, the salmon, salmon are the drivers. They are at the base and they are the, without the salmon, this place, uh, it, it wouldn't be what it is. Well, and that's, what's so scary to think about, you know, in your, in your birth state and my birth state as well, I'm from Oregon and, and, um, you know, with the, the, the situation there right now with, with steelhead and, um, and salmon as well. Um, you know, the, the, I hate to get all doom and gloom, but, um, the potential impacts to the entire Pacific Northwest e- ecosystem, if we, if we lose these fish could just be devastating. And I mean, the forests are, the forests are on fire and there's, there's no fish bringing nutrients in there to, uh, to replenish the trees. It's kind of a scary situation. Just, yeah, that's definitely it. one. Definitely yeah. one we're trying to avoid up here. And, you know, the other thing, the other thing about that, you know, people talk about the, the, you know, the bio, obviously the biological value is huge. The, the ecologic value to the, to the forest is huge. The, the, the commercial value and the recreational monetary value, you know, all those things are huge. But I think what we may, one of the things that at least I feel we may have lost sight of is the cultural value. You know, you're, you're, if you're born in Washington, you're from that land and part of your identity, you know, same thing with Oregon, Northern California, portions, of Idaho, British Columbia, South, uh, you know, Alaska, you're, you're, you're born into salmon culture. You're right. born into, you're born into that's, that is, that is who you are. If you choose to express that as a fisherman, that is who you are. And what's disheartening to me is see, is to see so many people and in a time of trouble turn away from their cultural identity and embrace i don't know carp uh i'm not gonna bag right (laughs) Right. you know i'm not gonna shame or bag but but we're you know this is it's it's the 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 shifting baseline where or the you know the people born into into a time of turmoil for salmon you know if you're born after 1990 which is a lot of people on the earth you don't have salmon as a relevant cultural touchstone if you live in the pacific northwest and that right. to me that to me is the scariest part that's just like whew, uh. yeah good point good point um how are the steelhead faring up there in your neck of the woods um you know in contrast to washington oregon california um our our populations tend to tend to follow coastwide trends um our our spring run this year was good, not great. We don't have a whole lot of monitoring. Um, matter of fact, there's only, I think, one enumeration weir in all of Alaska working right now. But we have a few things going for us. Um, speaking specifically the, to the Tongass, you know, most um, there's right now we have 300 and 35, 335 documented steelhead streams in Southeast Alaska. I think personally, I don't want to get off on a tangent here on this one, but I think, you know, I think that number is actually closer to 550. I think there's, there's, I know of at least a dozen that I've caught fish in that I, or seen fish in that I need to go document. But at any rate, we've got a bunch of really, and as I established before, most of these streams are fairly small. Um, the, the interesting thing about our steelhead populations is that they're, they're, with one or two exceptions uh, in the '90s, uh, which are now we don't plan anymore in those particular in those particular reaches, but they're all wi- these are all wild fish, right? Right. And about you know, let's just say the vast majority. And if I had to put a number on it, I'd say seventy five percent or so of those streams of the identified steelhead streams get two hundred spawning adults or fewer. There's some streams. There's about thirty or forty of them that have you know, between 200 and 600 fish a year. 
Uh, there's a relative handful that have between 600 and 1,000 fish here. And I can only think of two streams in southeast Alaska that I could reliably say produce over 1,000 spawning adults returning every year. And so our populations, as I said earlier, we have, a, we have one way to track abundance, uh, to track absolute abundance, and that's a, a weir uh, on one of our larger steelhead streams. And then there's 10 other streams that uh, the Department of Fish and Game does snorkel surveys on to get estimates. They're not, once again, you know, you can, if you observe, if you're in the water observing fish, you have to, unless you've got a fish tight weir that they have to pass through, you have to make assumptions. And one of those big assumptions is you didn't see anywhere near the total of fish, but then you try to figure out, well, how many fish did I see? And so Long story short, these guys have, you know, fishing game has expansion factors for all their counts. So they know they have a relative, a, you know, a, a general idea of how many fish are going on there, but we don't have monitoring. And that's kind of one of the big things we don't, you know, the budget for fishing game, who's the managing entity of the, uh, of the fish stocks in Southeast Alaska, even though the Tongass is uh, federal land, um, the, you know, fishing games budget has been, has been chipped away and chipped away and chipped away for years and 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 there's just not there's just not enough cash and at the moment political will to you know to enumerate these fish but circling back all the way to how are our fish doing well they trend you know we the big that we don't have we we have very few systems that are that are accessible enough that that sport fishing or handling a fish or tromping on reds would be an actual factor. Almost all the steelhead come in before uh, commercial fisheries. Some of them are intercepted in commercial fisheries, um, and so right now it just seems to be driven by ocean conditions. What and and you know after the blob after 2014 and the 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 wobble that we've gotten since then, you know I would say. I would say our 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 fish are holding up better than most at at the moment. But I haven't seen this year's run data. I haven't seen, you know, any I haven't talked to many folks at Fishing Game about predictions. So put a healthy asterisk on that one. Gotcha. Gotcha. And the, the blob that you're referring to was a mass of warm water within the oceanic migration corridor for steelhead, correct? Yeah, it was the Gulf of Alaska. The Gulf of Alaska sea surface down to depth temperature was was way higher than it should be. In in sci- in scientific terms, it was hot as hell. And and so yeah, you know, fish don't the, the funny thing about that is fish don't swim into these things and and keel over and die. What it does is it speeds up metabolisms. And and when you speed up juvenile fish metabolism, you know, feeding fish metabolism, especially salmonids, they require that much more energy for a specific unit of work, namely swimming around in the North Pacific being salmon, right? Right. And so when you start requiring more energy, that means they have to either find more energetic prey than they're already feeding on, or if they have the ability, switch to a more energetic prey. But if there's a whole bunch of fish at that time and you're you're you know you're trying to feed all or the the fish are all consuming this resource at a greater rate you run into problems right and that's also the warm you know the the warm water also upsets the the fundamental you know the primary product you know primary productivity of an area as well and so it's just it's that is just merely one of the factors going against our our beloved fish and then probably increased competition too, right? Because then you have other species coming into that warm water that may not necessarily be there, like, you know, catching Dorado, for instance, off the Oregon coast or. Yeah. You know, I'm sure that plays into it inter in inter species competition, but there's, you know, probably quite a bit of intra or intra salmonid competition. You know, there's, there's, the theory floating around now and well now it's been around for quite a while but the populations of pink salmon um can upset uh fisheries and you know there's one side one far side that says that that pinks are the driver of the ocean uh ecosystem and then there's the other far side that says 
that since salmon comprise, you know, three to 5% of all the large organisms, you know, the nekton as opposed to plankton, the large organisms swimming around the ocean that they po- couldn't possibly have an effect. And I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think, you know, I definitely think that pink salmon, wherever they come from, natural and wild, I think that, uh, or I should say hatchery versus wild, I think they, they, they do have an effect. Probably doesn't help that that we have, you know, more nations than just the United States, but we've we've shifted to this model of aquaculture where we're putting out, we're pasturing a whole bunch of fish that, you know, maybe, maybe the ocean is, is showing some signs of stress from that. And we're, we're seeing that signal as reduced or compromised runs. So gotcha. I, think there, I think there's still a ton of research to be done on that. There's some, there's some correlation in, in some, there's also some causation that looks like correlation. Um, I, I think it's one of those questions that we, we should, you know, we should start focusing on a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, what's really fascinating to me, um, about, uh, the, the rivers that you describe within the Tongass are that, uh, you know, each one of those streams you mentioned, you know, some of them are only, or the average size is one and a half kilometers. And, you know, with, within that stream, those steelhead in that stream are unique to that stream. They're like, you know, almost their own kind of subspecies in a way, um, which is, uh, which, you know, on the scale that, uh, that, that you're talking about thousands of rivers, there's just, um, that's an amazing, um, uh, diversity of, of individual runs of steelhead, even if they're only a hundred fish, those are unique to Skookum Creek or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, it depends on how, it depends on, on, on how granular you want to get. Um, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of work on, on, um, what, what's termed DPS, distinct population segments in Alaska. I think it'd be, I think it would be, uh, safe to say that if you broke Southeast Alaska down into, uh, biogeographic regions, meaning, you know, a region that shares, that has some common terrestrial ecosystem and, you know, meteorological conditions like the west side of an island or the east side of an island, you know, you can break those down into, into two biogeographic regions, right? There's 21 of those. And I would, I would, say that that within those 21 you could definitely make the case that those fish are are uh distinct to those regions um but steelhead man they're survivors they're survivors they're so plastic they're just you know even within these really small runs um you can have an incredible array of life histories uh i think well, I'll go with the one that I do know. There was one, uh, there was a survey, there was a weir put in on a creek down near Petersburg. I believe it was in the 80s. And I think the population of fish, you know, the amount, the number of fish that they passed through the weir uh, was, it was under 400. I know that. I, 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 it was like 380 fish or something like that. And out of that, they got 31 life histories, 31 different life history expressions. Now, for, I just realized that we're having this conversation that's, that's larger. I'm not including the rest of the people in the room. So um, a life history expression in steelhead is, is uh, how many, how many years it's been in fresh water, how many years it's been in salt water and how many times it has, cause they're repeat spawners, right? They can actually, they, unlike salmon, when uh, steelhead can come back in from the ocean spawn and go back out and actually, you know, in places that aren't the Columbia Basin, that aren't damned to hell, right. it, that, that get fewer than 0.1% repeat spawners. Um, it's very common in Southeast Alaska to see 30% of the run be repeat spawners, and in some cases up to 50% of the run being repeat spawners. So each one of those fish has a different life history, right? And so um, the most common one, it varies quite a bit, uh, in Southeast Alaska, but the two years in salt or two years in freshwater and three years in freshwater are both heavily represented in life histories. And then two years in saltwater and three years in saltwater. So, so four year old and, or uh, two years up to six year old fish, up to a three, three, a two, two to a three, three, those make up the largest portion of the run. But then within that, you've got fish that spent 
up to four years in freshwater. You've also got fish that came back after one season in the salt. Those are fairly rare. Uh, you've got fish that came back after four years in the salt. They're, you know, And then you've got fish that have spawned in, in one particular study. I saw a fish that had spawned. It was on its fifth spawning run. Fifth. Wow, man, fifth. that's a, that's insane, right? And so these fish, these fish co-evolved with these tiny creeks, maybe not down to the creek level, maybe to the biogeographic level, maybe just to southeast Alaska. They co-evolved with these creeks to be resistant enough so that with a population of two hundred fish, if there was some massive stochastic event, if we had some, like a massive landslide or something, there would be. You know, it wouldn't be wiping out a whole year's worth of run because within those tiny runs, we have fish that come back everywhere from from three and four year old fish to twelve year old fish, right? And so there's always steel there. There's always steelhead coming back to these creeks. Now that doesn't mean that that we can go out and love them to death. That doesn't mean that we don't need strong regulation. But it does mean that they're just amazingly they're they're adapted to be survivors, which is awesome. Man, yeah, man, that's that's great information. I want to I want to say you know I, I see there's a lot of stuff about uh, about wild steelhead retention, um, especially in you know in, in heavily pressured rivers. I think that's the issue du jour in Oregon right now. Um, and our steelhead, you can still keep wild steelhead in Southeast Alaska in some places. There's very few places. Most of our most of our uh, smaller streams, most of our um, areas where there's populations, you know, it's catch and release in those areas. But in 1994, uh, our fishing game came up with, uh, our department of fishing game came up with a pretty, at the time it was a pretty amazing solution. And I still, I still think it holds and it's a really common sense solution. And that was, you can keep one wild steelhead a day. You can keep up to two a year. Those fish have to be over 36 inches. The reason those fish have to be over 36 inches is because that measurement protects about 95% of first time spawners. So that basically says, all right, you can, the fish can come in, they can spawn, they can go away. All right. They go back out. They can return to spawn again. If it's larger than that, Hey, if you really want to keep a steelhead, you can keep a steelhead. Now, I'm not espousing that for anywhere else in the nation, but I'm just like, get people to think out of the box. It's not an all or nothing. There are still people that, that as part of their cultural identity, harvest steelhead. Some choose to use rod and reel. And we have to be, you know, we have to understand it, that, that in some cases, in some cases where it's warranted, harvest is all right. Now, I know that that's going to get me a lot of hate mail because most of these places in Oregon and Washington State. Well, you can still probably, keep them on the southern Oregon coast. There's yeah. no fish down there. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of ridiculous. After, so, yeah, after, yeah, looking at all agree, that, after looking at all that, that's just, that's amazing. But our steelhead harvest went from, you know, thousands per year um, down to, uh, for both subsistence and, uh, and fishing uh, sport harvest. I right in like two to 300 fish a year. And so as long as we can keep that, then I think we're good. Um, if we do start to see more, more, uh, you know, more disturbance in the forest as it were, we're gonna, probably going to need to address that with tighter regulation and basically just chop off uh, retention of wild steelhead. Gotcha. So, so I had read that, you know, most of the Tongass is not congressionally protected. Um, what, uh, what sort of, threats are facing the national forest and um, you know, what, uh, what type of measures would you folks like to see put in place uh, in order to thwart those? Well, you know, the logging has always been the principal, the principal issue in the Tongass. And, and that's, you know, we've got this history of, of resource extraction with um, without up until recently without regard for, you know, some of the damage that resource extraction was doing. And, uh, from, as a relic from the, from the mill era, when, when timber, the timber industry was subsidized by federal dollars. I mean, it's been over the years, it's been subsidized to the tune of about half a billion, you know, $500 million, about $22 million a year. Um, that's dropped off in the, in the very recent, 
time, but it's still 10, you know, it's still, there's still millions of dollars being spent in timber planting. Um, it, you know, it, and I'm not talking about selective cut. I'm not talking about, I think selective cuts great. If you're going to be a forester, um, you know, I, I'm not a hypocrite. I own, I own instruments that have tone wood that were cut very close to my house. Uh, I live in a wood home. Um, but the, the, the thing that I'm talking about is industrial clear cut logging where, where massive swaths of forest are taken down and that can really upset hydrology, you know, river hydrology. We're, we're a, we're an area of rivers, you know, we're 4% of the land mass of Alaska in the Tongas. Uh, we produce more than 25% of the fish. And so we're basically a land area that's support, a support system for salmon streams. And when you start altering the landscape on a landscape scale, like industrial logging is capable of, you upset balances, you upset hydrological balances, you upset ecological balances. And, and that's definitely a threat. Luckily those years, um, the large, 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 you know, the, the 450 million board feet a year era, that's, that's behind us. Um, it's, it, it, you know, a lot, the logging industry has been, um, has been on the way in, in large part because of, um, it's just, it's onerous. They, you can't up here, you can't really, uh, and I don't want to speak for them, but here's what I see is that you have to be subsidized. Somebody has to build the road for you. Somebody has to do all the footwork for you. So you can go in and cut down trees to sell because it costs so much to get people out there to cut them. It costs so much to transport the trees to a mill. You know, there's all these things that go into this that, and so the logging industry has been on the wane, um, except there's, you know, a bunch of little small mills and, and independent foresters, but that's, you know, the, the, the other threat that comes along with, with new, you know, people want transportation corridors and things like that. Road building is by the forest service, you know, by the land manager's zone of mission, roading and poor upkeep of roading and improper fish passage design are the number one threat to fish in the Tongas. And right now we've got, you know, we've got a relative handful of, of rivers that are really in need of, of restoration. Probably I'd say 50 total that are in need of some uh, variety of restoration so that they can go back to being fully functioning fish watersheds. Right. And then the other thing that we have to attack is we've got all these legacy roads and then we've got also some useful roads that came out of the logging industry, but we need to make sure that we have fish passage structures on those, on, you know, all the places that you cross all the water in Southeast Alaska, to make sure that we're not disconnecting uh, habitat. And so that's the biggest, right now it's the legacy of the logging industry and and it's the potential for new roading uh, for for non-public gain that we're really looking at so gotcha gotcha and so where can folks go to learn more about uh, the Tongas and uh, and TU's work and uh, and these issues that uh, that you're you're bringing up here uh, the easiest place to go would be www.americansalmonforest.org. And that's our, uh, that's the uh, coalition website at TU is a portion of that coalition. Uh, concerned hunters, anglers, uh, sport fishing businesses, commercial fishermen that would like to, uh, that would like to see salmon recognized as the true renewable resource on the Tongas. So that's a good, that's a great place to start. That's got information on, uh, on the fish, the fishing, the cultural, you know, the cultural aspects of the Tongas, the people and our vision for our vision for a, uh, a fish friendlier place. Well, excellent. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. This is highly informative 
and um, I hope to get up there someday and, uh, and and lay eyes on this place myself. It sounds incredible. It's a magical, like salmon wonderland, the salmon forest, really a unique ecosystem that uh, that you're working hard to, to protect. And, uh, and uh, we need advocates like you. So thank you for all your hard work as well. Oh, thanks much, man. I wouldn't, wouldn't do it without the help of, of you and others and without the backing of everybody that we've got. And you should come up because the one thing that you probably haven't seen is a pink salmon eat a dead drifted dry fly, like a true upstream presentation. <laughs> no, I have not seen that. <laughs> you, you, I would like to see that for you, sure. Along with the rest of the world needs to see the glory that is the pink salmon. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, man, thanks again and, uh, and be well. All right. Thanks a bunch for having me. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.